Unlike in this school parking lot, there are rows and rows of handicapped spots at the hospital. As we roll toward admittance, admittance, I think how weird it is going to see a neurologist, or any doctor really, that's not for me. I wish it felt nicer. Mima and Grandpa have both dressed up in their church clothes. Every single time I see Mima in pantyhose, it makes me think of church and funerals. I can't bear to think of either. I want to go back to the trailer and bake a giant batch of oatmeal butterscotch cookies. But when we bake it, when we make it past the receptionist, mom is out of breath and her hair is standing up like a Muppet. We are so late. The room they lead us to isn't like any exam room I've ever seen. It's more like an office with a big polished desk and a print of sunflowers on the wall, which beats the airplanes and train carpet at the kids' hospital by a mile. Mima glances up when we walk in, and she looks wrung out, like someone took her by her lace collar and shook her. A doctor in a suit and a white coat stands and holds out a hand. He looks 12. Okay, maybe not 12, but young. Real young. I have no idea where Grandpa is. Sorry, we're late, Mother, Mom says to Mima. It's all right, honey. Your dad's just getting dressed. Dr. Hirschman was filling me in. Mom turns to him. Alice, Alice Cohen... Like she's James Bond. Alice. Alice Cohen. Like she's James Bond. I'd appreciate it if you'd catch me up. Alice, yes. I was just telling your mother that Jonah seems to be in peak form. Other than the nose fracture, he is in perfect health physically. We all take in the long pause before physically. I'm familiar with the long pause. It never comes before anything good. I grip my armrests. But, Mom says... But, Dr. Hirschman says, the Alzheimer's is progressing faster than we'd anticipated. He stops and looks every single one of us in the eye. There are some decisions that need to be made. Mom grasps Mima's hand and takes a seat. I roll behind them and bump into Mom's chair trying to get closer. We are a sad circle. What kind of decisions, Mom asks, all quiet like a little girl. I miss her take charge, James Bond voice. In regard to whether Mr. Cohen might need to be moved to a facility that can better meet his needs. A facility. I know what that means. It's a fancy word for an old folks home. It'll swap his sawdust smell with disinfectant. I want to throw something, but Mima gets there first. Meet his needs better than his own home? With his own family? Mima taps the doctor's desk with her fist on home and family. Dr. Hirschman nods. Given the recent accident and the incident at the church, there are things to be considered. His steeples, he steeples his fingers. They are long and smooth. They are long and smooth. The smoothness bothers me. He's too young to be playing with people's lives. Like, what could he possibly know about all this? Things like whether he is in danger to him. Things like whether he is a danger to himself or others. Mima puts her hands back in her lap and looks down. Not yet. What's that, ma'am? Mima looks up. I said, not yet. I'm not ready to give up on him. I have been married to that man for almost 50 years, and we've been through the ringer, I will tell you. She points a finger at him like he's trying to call a bluff. I meant it when I said, in sickness and in health, and I'll know quitting time when I see it. This isn't it. Her voice breaks at the end. I got my girl here now, my girl's. Mima reaches back and fumbles for both our hands. I roll forward as far as I can. I wish I could bulldoze my way right through this wall in the hospital and take Mom and Mima and Grandpa with me. We wouldn't stop until we hit the ocean. This can't be reality. It can't. Doctors don't know everything. Mr. Hirschman steeples his fingers again in size. Mr. Cohen is 70 years old and healthy. There's a good chance he could live 10, 20 more years while his mind continues to deteriorate. Are you prepared for that? Mima stands and puts her hand on the doorknob. Doctor, we are all, we are all of us deteriorating, she says and opens the door. We might as well do it together. Mom gets up like she's going to follow, but turns to me instead and says, Ellie, you go with your grandmother. I'll be out in a second. Alice, what are you doing? I'll be out in a minute, mother. I can't read mom's face, but I can read Mima's. It's the angry emoji times a million. Mad is better than sad, though, at least for right now. I want to tell her that Mom's a genius at the workaround. Maybe she'll come up with something the doctor has never considered. I pull on Mima's hand a little until she starts moving again. 
Back out front, we spot Grandpa in the waiting area talking to a little girl wearing an Elsa dress. They're standing in front of the fish tank. We move toward them. Your mother is trying to kill me, Ellie, Nima says angrily. Nah, she has her methods. I bet she's just giving that doctor a piece of her mind. At least I hope so. Grandpa turns when he sees us coming. He's neat and tidy and smiling. He looks like himself, healthy and strong. He looks happy. Marianne, look who I found in reception. We both look at the girl. I wonder if I'm supposed to know her too, but Mima looks just as confused as me. Look, Em, it's little Lily. Can you believe our baby granddaughter has finally learned to walk? He claps his hands together. It's a miracle. Time stops, and then it starts again, and I'm rolling on by now, past the fish and the girl, past my grandmother, gently taking my grandfather by the elbow into the hallway where windows overlooking the parking lot. I catch sight of myself in the reflection and cannot remember when I started to cry. It's way past lunchtime when we leave the hospital, and I haven't eaten anything since a rush bowl of oatmeal this morning, but my stomach feels sloshy and heavy, like I drank too much water. I don't look at Grandpa as Mima walks him out to the Buick, and Mom loads me into the van. When we pull onto Route 9, all I want to do is go home and crawl into bed and wake up in Nashville. But instead of crossing the bridge that will take us back across the lake, we head toward town. Where are we going? One more stop, baby. I promise. And then home. I lean my head against the cold window. Maybe Grandpa has it right. It'd be nice to forget your life. It's why I like to bake. When you're doing something that takes all your brain power, the world kind of falls away and leaves you alone. You can be anywhere when your mind is full, is so full of an idea. Maybe that's what Alzheimer's is, a thing that fills your mind so full of a story that the real world can't get in. Except that's a scary thought if you don't get to pick the plot. By the time we pull into the Food & Co., I can tell I've been in my chair too long. My legs ache and I can feel the seat rubbing a bruise into my tailbone. There's a crisscrossing of yellow tape across the front window of the store and the brick along the bottom is all toppled over. It looks like a crime scene, which I guess it is. What are we doing here? Damage control, Mom mutters as the street lights flicker on in the darkness of the gray afternoon. Ever since I got my first pink wheelchair at four and began to notice all the things I could and couldn't reach, Food & Co. has been my favorite place. It's like a crippled kid's dream. Everything's set out in barrels and low shelves and little round tables. Orange and pink and yellow taffy sit in a huge bucket by the register, and homemade sausage biscuits stay warm all day in their plastic wrap under the seat heat lamps. If you swing by the deli, you can always beg free samples of cheese, and the bakery will give you free fudge without nuts, which everybody knows is the best. It's like the original version of Cracker Barrel. Today we go straight to customer service, which is actually just a desk next to a stand where they sell stamps and boxes for mailing. Mr. Akers is there, always. I know he's a good bit younger than Grandpa, but his hair is completely white and he wears glasses that take up half his face. He is the friendly owl you might meet in the forest. He smiles at us now, even though we're related to the man who wrecked his window. Well, Ellie Cohen, you are a vision. Hi, Mr. Akers. He claps his hands and rubs them together like he's warming them up before holding out one out to shake. And how are you, Alice? How are you, Walter? Mom does this, answers a question with a question when she's ready, getting ready to make a point. I think it was part of her teacher training. Well, now, we um, had a bit of a run-in, as you well know. How's Jonah? How's his nose? That's what I came to speak to you about. Mom pulls him off to the side and around behind the stamp stand. Suddenly, I'm starving. My stomach gurgles and I can feel it all the way down to my toes. I go searching for the sausage biscuits and grab a package of Hostess cupcakes on the way. The New York Times chefs wouldn't approve, but I love how, if you're real careful, you can pull the squiggle off the top in one long line. There's a table near the meat counter and it's set up with a red checkered tablecloth and a vase of fake daisies. It's a display for Miss Daisy's home cooking a local catering company, which everybody knows is Daisy Elcott from down the street, whose husband died two years ago, and so she needs something to do with her hands. I set my food down next to a case of pin, pimento cheese. That's the kind of place this is. You can just grab stuff and eat it in the middle of the store, and nobody thinks you're stealing or tries to page your mom over the intercom. You are very attractive. I choke on a piece of sausage and look up to see a kid standing in front of me with his arms crossed over a white apron. And is that blood on it? Excuse me, 
I said, you are very attractive. At least he pauses and I swear to look, I swear to you, looks me up and down. Your average comes out right. He takes one chair opposite me. He's got hair as black as Harry Potter's with none of the charm. I look around to see if I'm being watched. This has to be a joke, right? Uh, so I'm attractive or average? He blinks at me and then blinks again. And it's like the computer's spinning wheel. Like he's uploading information. I am just going to have to wait it out. I crumple my trash and start to look for an easy exit. Both. According to researchers, it's often the most average or symmetrical faces that are most appealing. Uh-huh. I act all put out, but I kind of get that. People like ordinary, even numbers, even teeth, average height and intelligence. But in my experience, nobody would call a girl in a wheelchair attractive unless he was messing with her. He's still blinking at me. That is blood on his apron. His name tag says Bert. I wonder if he works here or if he's just snuck in to butcher something. A scene flashes from the people under the stairs, and I shiver. All right, then. Well, I think I hear my mom. Catch you later. He just stands and holds out his arm that says, after you, miss. I can feel his eyes on me when I leave. There you are. Mom is standing at the top, at the front, holding a ginormous bag of groceries. I pull the food wrappers from my pocket, and she rolls her eyes, but hands me some cash. I run them through self-checkout and think how weird it is to hear the same automated voice from the Publix at home say, please take your receipt here at Food & Co. Where were you? Mom asks as I follow her out to the car, getting verbally harassed. What? Relax, I'm kidding. Sort of. I think it was just a really creepy kid or employee. Whatever. He had a name tag like he works here. Was he around your age? Yeah. Was his name Robert? No. Oh, wait. Yes, his name tag said Bert. Why are you laughing? Mom doesn't say anything until we get to the van.